in Wales, but uh, in the UK as a whole. So it's my pleasure to introduce Warren. Hey. I don't know if we're part of the digital revolution, but you can tell I'm a startup founder because I wear trainers to presentations and, and an untucked shirt. Um, but today I want to talk about uh, Lean Startup. Um, can I get a show of hands? Uh, who's aware of Lean Startup? Put your hand up if you've heard of the term before. Okay, about half. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about Lean Startup, and it's, I wanted to just kind of encapsulate it in less than 10 things. So we've got nine and a half things that we've learned about Lean Startup. And uh, we will be tweeting. If you want to learn about more startup stuff, I'm on Twitter, at WarrenOF. And if you want to follow Nudged, our tweets will make you healthier. We're a health tech business. Um, founded about two years ago, we work with corporates to make health and wellness, wellness programs more effective. That's kind of our take on technology. But I'll crack on, because we're running a little bit behind. But, um, so this is a guy called Steve Blank. And he's generally seen as the guy who initiated Lean Startup. And Steve Blank is out in Stanford and he lectures on entrepreneurship, so he's relatively credible. And he says, no business plan survives first contact with customers. And what he's saying is, you can spend as much time in your white ivory tower planning what you're going to do, but until you get out of that tower and start talking to the people who are going to consume and use the things you're intending to make, you don't really know anything. And so that's the kind of the nugget in the middle of Lean Startup. And Steve also says that a, a startup is not a business. A business knows its business model. A startup is an organization searching for a business model. And that's something that's going to come back through these points. So our interpretation of, of, of what Steve uh, says is that, that we should find better ways to plan businesses. And one of the tools we use is a thing called the Business Model Canvas. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of it, but it's basically a really simple communication tool. And the reason we like it is because it represents every element of your business on one page. And it's not perfect, no tool does everything, but what it allows us to do is to share the knowledge that we all have as individuals in the business. So there's eight of us at the minute, and the minute you get towards eight, it becomes a little bit more fractious, it becomes a little bit harder to keep those communication lines open. And the Business Model Canvas is a place where we can gather around and change the elements of this business plan that we, that we need to, based on the learnings that we had from contacts with customers or technology or the different areas of the business that are relevant to us. And the thing I really like about the Business Model Canvas, and if you haven't used it for your organization before, I, I definitely recommend going back and spending you know, an hour just watching some videos online and trying it, is its iterative nature. When you start a business, a lot of kind of founding and startup kind of literature says you are the hero. You're the one who knows everything. You've got to get out there, just like Steve was mentioning earlier. And actually, you don't know anything. Because you don't, if you're making something even slightly innovative, you don't know the application of it. You don't know what the reaction from the market's going to be. So the business model canvas is a great way to kind of change scenarios. And you can quickly put post-it notes down and pull them off and learn where the sensitivities in your model are. So one of the things we've learned about Lean Startup is plan in a way that's lean. Don't try and make a business plan that's 30 pages long, fit this kind of lean and agile approach. The second guy who kind of had a big impact on the lean startup movement is a guy called Eric Ries. And his book, The Lean Startup, is kind of was seminal for me. I was recommended it by some guys from Mozilla who were out in San Francisco with getting a bit drunk and they thought it was a, a good thing for me to read. And, uh, and Eric Ries's book is really seminal for me personally. And the thing he said is, the only way to win is to learn faster than everyone else. When you're a small organization starting out, you've only got one real advantage, and that's your agility, your, your ability to move quickly. And moving quickly relies on you learning quickly. And it's really important that you take learning and apply it faster than larger organizations can. So if you're going up against IBM, IBM's strength is, you know, they've got massive sales teams, they've got long, trustworthy, kind of big architecture, all those kind of things. But can they react to new changes in, you know, cloud payment systems or authentication or react to new areas of the market that are emerging really rapidly? Will they be able to understand them quick enough? Because most of the people in their organization are focused on implementation of things they already know. Whereas in a startup, you don't really know anything. You just have an idea, a vision, a, a process to apply, and hopefully some smart people to apply it. And one of the things that comes out of uh, Eric's book is, uh, is learning loops. 
So the idea that you build something, you, you, you learn, you create, you learn, you create. And at the beginning of your business, you want those loops to really be quite short. So they call it the minimum viable product. I'm not sure if anyone's heard that term before, but it's the smallest thing that you can make to test a hypothesis about your business. So for instance, um, if you were interested in selling shoes online, there's a couple of different premises there, some hypotheses you've got that people, one, are looking to buy shoes online, that they feel it's secure enough to buy those shoes online, and that you can then fulfill that shoe buying order. And so instead of building an e-commerce shop from scratch and making loads of assumptions, a way to test that model would be to, one, maybe launch an eBay store, go and see, or go and review what shoes are being sold online and do some secondary research. You may want to build a really simple landing page that says, buy shoes here and try different kinds of shoes and different kinds of messaging to understand why is someone buying shoes online. And you can A-B test it, and you can run pay-per-click ads, and you can understand what marketing works effectively to draw people to that message. And that might cost you a fraction of the cost of developing a fully functioning e-commerce website. And any learning you make along the way, you can really quickly apply it back into those so same MVPs so that you're iterating and building something that is not inherently technology you've created to begin with, but will become something that's unique to you over time. And there's a lot of hubris there about creating your own platforms. But the best thing about modern web and online technology is the, uh, the demo democratization of technology, so APIs feeding into things, you know, feeds of technology and data coming into one place that allow you to hack very quickly platforms that are relatively interesting and unique to different marketplaces. So the third guy I'm going to mention is a guy called Ash Mayura. He wrote a book called Running Lean, which is kind of like a playbook to Eric Ries's kind of thought philosophical kind of uh, documentary book. So Ash's book is a step-by-step process of how to apply lean into a business and to a startup. And it's not perfect by any means. We've, we've run through the book. We used it very early, uh, early days with Nudged. Um, and we found its flaws. But the, the one thing it's really strong on is it says, why build something that nobody wants? And it's very easy to go out there with a vision and say, I like it, so it's good. But validation of that message is really, really important because most of us, in all honesty, are going to go out there with some kind of commercial edge to our organization. It's like, you know, there's charity sector, there's a third sector, there's social ventures, social enterprise, all those kind of different gamuts of things. But there, there usually has to be some kind of financial flow through an organization. And Ash's book focused mo mostly on that kind of adoption of early messages. But one of the things we've recognized within uh, what we do is there's actually there's three things that we really have to care about. Um, and the first one we care about is feasibility. So it's one thing to build something or create an idea of things that people want, but if you can't deliver that, then there's no real point in starting. The second thing is engagement. People have to want to do it. And when you look at the large kind of unicorn businesses that are out there, so you've got your Facebooks and your Twitters, and they actually they went for feasibility and engagement first and completely ignored revenue for a long time. And the reason they could do that was because they've got a venture capital kind of base over there that allows them to ignore revenue and go big strategic long term. In Wales, we've raised kind of about 300 grand to date. Um, we are not quite there in that kind of like, you know, uh, people betting on such a long term uh, strategic ventures. So revenue was important to us and we recognized really early doors that we wanted to generate revenue from our product to prove that what we had was worth people paying for. And we got some early phase customers on board and that helped us to raise our money. Though it definitely crippled that kind of adoption rate, that's that, that kind of K factor, that seismic growth that comes from freemium it did help us to raise money on a functional basis. But there's always this tension with the organization where I want to build something that people want, but my tech team is saying, we can't build that feasibly in this time frame. And my sales team is saying, look, this is what people will pay for. So if they won't pay for it, should we build it, even though it may be good for them in the long term? And balancing those, those, those tensions is, is part of the role of a founder in, in, a, in a lean organization. Uh, this guy, Paul Bushite, says, if everything you do works, you probably aren't taking many risks or innovating. And there's an inherent risk in startups, and you have to be ready for things to go wrong. Like, things you do will go wrong, and accepting of things going wrong and, you know, learning from it is really key. 
And it's one of the hardest things we find with bringing people in from larger organizations to work for the team is convincing them that it's okay to mess up. As long as you don't make the same mistakes repeatedly, time and time again, as long as you're learning from it, improving and iterating, then mistakes are part of our process. If we knew exactly what was going to sell and exactly how to make it, um, we'd be doing it already. And the whole process of Lean Startup is very much about mitigating risk, because that's what we're doing. We're, we're, kind of, we're driving a train and building a train track at the same time, just in front of us. And a lot of time, it's quite hectic. You're laying down tracks and not quite knowing where you're going whilst trying to power this train at full force, because your venture capital backers are looking for you to make a return in three to five years. And at the same time, you've got a team who don't quite know what they're doing as well. And you've kind of got to bring all these people together. But accepting the fact that things will go wrong and not punishing people for trying things that they thought might work kind of builds that culture. And the way that we manage this is through a, a, a system called Kanban that was developed by Toyota. Toyota's kind of just-in-time manufacturing models with kind of lean manufacturing precludes lean startup and is a really, really cool model. And uh, the way we break ourselves up is uh, into research, design, and implement. And what we realize is of all the stuff we do, there's going to be a huge percentage of waste. But waste is not bad. Waste is learning. We're learning how not to do things. So at a research end, everything is relatively cheap, quick, lightweight. Those loops, those build-learn loops, really quick, really fast. We go out and we say, so we want to sell to uh, technology businesses. So if we want to sell to technology businesses in the UK, where we're based, how many of them are there? How big's the market? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Do we need to be in London? Or can we do it anywhere? Will they buy remotely? Do they have health and wellness programs? And really quickly, we can say, right, we're going to look at seven different markets and throw three of them away, five of them away, six of them away, all of them away really fast. So the waste occurs. And then your ideas get to the next stage. And at design, we start validating them into kind of prototypes. We start looking at how we could make them. Can we make this? Is it functional? Does it work? And at that phase, we expect to throw away you know, two thirds. Two thirds of our work gets, gets scrapped, happily gets scrapped. If we're not scrapping two thirds of it, we're probably not innovating enough. So we might do three design iterati iterations that go out for acceptance testing and throw two of them away, or all of them change 50%, merge and combine, and we learn and we move. And then implement, that's the expensive bit. Because that's the bit that reaches customers. And that's the bit that reaches scale. And implement, we want things to be repeatable, we want them to be scalable, and we want them to be a bit more efficient. And at implement, you know, developers cost quite a lot of money, and we want to keep them focused on solving the problems they have to solve. So they're going to work out the math, they're going to do the computer science and figure out how to deploy that to a server. And at that stage, even at that stage, we're expecting 10% wastage. Um, and in fact, what I do is I give my, my guys get um, half a day a week on a Friday afternoon to do what the hell they like. So they get a half day to build something on something else. And it's been really useful for us in that we've learned how to use React.js, which is Facebook's front-end infrastructure. We built some apps for fun on that in some afternoons, brought it back into the, to the, to the system because we knew it was stable. We'd played with it enough. So I'd encourage you to make waste something that's part of your strategic process. Brad Feld, really interesting kind of futurist thinker in the technology sector, says something new is fucked up in my world every day. And that is 100% true for startups. If you're not prepared for things to mess up and be there for you to solve, you've kind of got to be comfortable with it. Like, it, it, it's such a, a, an emotional roller coaster. It's, it's tough. You've got the financial pressures. And if you don't like fixing problems, if you want things to be nice and stable, you're probably in the wrong role if you're founding a startup. And Lean kind of helps you to deal with those things by, by setting that attitude. The thing that keeps me awake at night is the unknown unknowns. What I don't know, I don't know worries me. So there's something out there in our system that is broken. You know, somewhere we're hitting someone's spam constantly, or you know, there's some, some widget somewhere that's not doing the thing that it does, or some change in the market, some legislation is coming through that's going to make us redundant. That's what worries me. And we spend a lot of time worrying about what we don't know, which is really hard. You know, it's, it's a tough thing to worry about. Um, and try and move it into the next phase, which is that we know that we don't know about it. So, hey, we don't know about enough about legislation. Cool, let's do some research into legislation and try and figure out what, the, you know, what, what it all looks like. 
So it moves into a known unknown, and finally we want it to be a known, so we know there's a problem. When we know there's a problem, we worry a lot less about it than when we, we don't know there's a problem. If everything's going right, that's when I'm shitting myself. Excuse my French. <laughs> uh, Jeff Bezos, you probably know of, he's the founder of Amazon, so an incredibly strategic guy, kind of big thinker. But he says, if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, it's too large. And I love that phrase, because I know from creative sector, you hit like some, some, some little jumps. So normally that's about eight. When you get to about eight people, it becomes tough to maintain all those communications. And you've got managers and administration and some fragmentation to your team. To be honest, above five, it starts getting tough. But luckily, because we're a kind of technology startup, we get to design from the ground up, and this is one of our advantages over people like you know, IBM or existing companies, is we get to adopt things really fast. So we use a range of systems, and the only goal of these systems is to make communication as easy as possible, as thoughtless as possible. Let's make it so that people can just talk or collaborate. So we use Slack, which is a messaging system that's like hugely successful and, and, and only been around for a short amount of time that we integrate lots of things into. So there's one central place you can ask questions and talk to people. Uh, we've got GitHub, which I'm sure you're all aware of if you're in the tech sector. It's just for our developers to aid communication, documentation, you know, things. High fidelity communication is really key. So things not getting lost through word of mouth, that's, that's, that's important to us. We've got Google Drive that allows us to collaborate on documents and comment and share things really quickly. We use Pipe Drive, which is a sales kind of workflow that allows tasks to be assigned to the sales teams and back to the delivery teams and vice versa. Trello, really visual project planning, which is where that waste happens. So we know you have the uh, research design implementation um, boards on Trello. Uh, and then Appearin, which is an awesome, like if you haven't tried appear.in, it's a, a digital meeting room. It's just a video that's constantly running. So you just log in, you appear in forward slash your company name, and you can just share that link with anyone and jump straight into a vi video chat. And that allows us to work flexibly, remotely. We've got one team member who's part-time in Aberystwyth, and you know, I'm always on the road jumping around, and daily stand-ups happen, which is where we try and pull everyone together to just say, what have you done today? What are you doing tomorrow? What do you need? All of these tools help us not to go in the wrong direction from each other. Jim Collins, who's a, a big figurehead in kind of business over in the States, says, if you have more than three priorities, then you don't have any. And I'm sorry, Steve, that kind of goes against your list of things that you were doing, but uh, I, I struggle with focus. I'm a starter. I do things. I just kind of throw my head against a brick wall and ice break and pull things into my life. But what I'm learning is that I can only really do three things effectively. So making sure those are the three right things is really important. And Ashley, one of our um, investors who's leading this, this round that we're currently doing, gave me this model, which is do now, do next, do later, and quick wins. So in my task flow, I have things that I know I need to do now. So I have to do them today. Then I have my, you know what, that comes immediately after that section. And then finally, the do later is it could go away. It, it, it may go away. Um, if it doesn't go away, it becomes more important. It'll move forward. And quick wins is for anything I could... If I get spare time, if I did that, my life gets easier or better or the business grows. And we try and use these buckets with the team. And again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, kind of, it's a training thing we do. We talk to everyone about prioritization and help them to find tools that work for them. So some of the guys use Pomodoro techniques. Some of them use you know, their own task management systems uh, alongside our own. Um, but having focus is, is really important. Deciding what that focus should be is even more important. Uh, I'm sure you know who Thomas Edison is, but he said, vision without execution is hallucination. Uh, and again, it's something I'm really guilty of. I'm a big vision person. I'll tell you about how amazing Nudged is going to be when we are the premium health content API that integrates with everyone else's health advice systems and gives you everything you want and will be a, a billion users. But actually, what matters right now to me is meeting the next, uh, meeting the next uh, business to, to, to engage with. And what we've learned from this is that research is not research. Research doesn't really matter. Building is research. Sales is research. Engagement is research. Doing things and learning from them is the research that matters. So if you sat there with a pile of research, but you haven't done anything, 
then you probably, you, you probably not made as much progress as you should have. Ben Horowitz, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, massive investment organization out in the US, said planning is useful, though the plan is usually useless. And I completely agree. Planning is shared knowledge. The plan is usually redundant by the time we roll it out because we move so quickly. So I spend 30% 30, 30 of my week is planning what I'm going to do with the other 70%. And where possible, we collaboratively plan. Letting someone else know what you're doing when you're a larger team becomes really, really important, especially when you're a figurehead of the organization. If people don't know what you're doing, they get worried. So making sure my team are aware of the things, the good news that's coming, the way that we're working the company. We have things like quarterly team forums where we sit down together and talk about the business as a whole. So my team know what shares and share options and things look like. They understand it as well as the next founder would. And finally, my 9.5, because it's, it's, it's from me, um, Lean won't solve your problems. So any number of beautiful quotes and pieces of advice from someone stood on a stage with a Britney Spears microphone, um, it's not going to solve those problems that crop up for you. You've got to solve your own problems. So every process you're given is up to you to use it in a way that's relevant to you. And taking those big decisions is the hard bit of startup. So if you feel you have the strength of will to kind of force through those issues and, and keep on learning, and, and the force of will to be wrong, being comfortable with being wrong, then I'd suggest you take a look at Lean Startup and maybe listen to half the things I've said and find the rest of, for, for yourself. But other than that, thank you so much for listening. If you want to connect with me, I'm at Warrenov and at Nudged. If you want to get healthier, listen to our tweets. Thank you so much. <laughs>